patients come to clinic, we get them as their first visit to fill in something called a consent to disclosure. So this is a, a piece of paper that is the consent form that Katrina kind of mentioned a bit about, which asks the patient specifically, and their partner fills in one for themselves too about disclosure. So sharing information with relevant health professionals, with their GP, and with all and people involved in the clinic. So I guess the question I want to ask to Jane is, how many of your patients fill this in when they're having licensed treatment and say no to confidentiality disclosure? A small proportion do, um, but I'm not in, sorry, thank you. A small proportion do say, say no. Um, some of them will say no to anything, which is one of the options apart from for emergencies. Um, we do try to discuss that with them so that they understand actually what that means, including that we can't share with the rest of the hospital. Um, or their general practice. I think there are some very specific situations where that is more pertinent. For instance, for the use of donor gametes, you don't necessarily need to understand that in quite the same way, or at least it can be disclosed in a different way. Um, but for the general run of the mill things, I don't think it's helpful at all. And actually, we don't find those forms very helpful. We don't complete them when complication patients come to the clinic for the first time. We complete them when they start any licensed treatment, because that's when it becomes relevant. OK. Um, Gwen, I don't know if you've seen any patients or got any feedback from patients where they don't want this to change, where they do still want to maintain this discreet kind of barrier between general <coughs> hospital and medical care and, and fertility treatment. <coughs> no. <laughs> um, no, because by the time um, people have went through treatment, it's a couple, um, and it is invasive and it is gruelling and if they're successful, how it's been described to me is they have been sitting screaming at the midwife, absolutely screaming internally. You have no idea what it took me to get here and please don't look at me as if I'm neurotic. Um, because of every twinge they're on the phone, which is understandable. And the other side of that is um, absolutely when, when someone is unsuccessful and they have come to the end of their journey, um, they need further support. And I think at that stage, you know, just like the five ladies that we interviewed um, and the Heather, who had been unsuccessful, all said they wish their medical um, professionals had known. It's just when you start your journey, you feel completely different before what you're about to embark on. Okay. So I think there's a bit of a kind of sense of us here that we think that this is a change that should happen. I guess the thing that Jane alluded to as well was this sense of well, you know, we have a duty as medics and as health professionals to keep your medical details so discreet and confidentiality can confidential anyway. So why does infertility need to sit in a different space when those rules should apply? Because you might argue somebody that's a cancer survivor has been through hell and back. You might argue that somebody that's had a transplant or somebody whose husband's been very ill or has lost a child, all of these things are so terribly personal and so terribly difficult that why should that be treated in a different way to fertility problems? And that's sort of, I guess, where I, where I stand. So I guess what do we need to do then, Katrina, to make the law change if we wanted to, if there was a buy-in from a lot of people to change it? That's a, I think that's a million dollar question, I think. Um, as with a lot of issues that have come up, particularly with this Act, there's a lot of call to change quite a lot of things in the Human Fertilisation and Biology Act, but the problem is people are very, very scared to approach it at all for fear of losing some of the progress that we have made in terms of embryo research and IVF and other things. So the answer is I'm not actually sure it can be very difficult. So I'm trying to think back to when, in sort of 2008, when it was last sort of updated, and what the arguments were then. And um, I seem to think that some of the donor conception community were very concerned, not because they didn't want openness, but because they thought it was, you know, it was a privacy issue. And it's been interesting to hear from Jane 
and from Katrina about in what circumstances it would be that a, a child would find out what's in their parents' medical records and if that ever happens because I'm not certain whether it does or not. You might tell them more about how they might, but people can. Um, ask for medical records if you're a power attorney and those kind of things. You can get your parents' medical records, you might turn them up once they've died and find out things. So I think um, the use of donor gametes has thrown up all sorts of questions, particularly in terms of keeping things a secret from children. And we would always encourage people to tell their children of their genetic origins for exactly that reason. And I think there's so much more debate in that from the, from the um, genetic testing and things that can happen now, you cannot keep that secret and it definitely isn't going to be kept in the future, so it, it, it has, it's a secret that has to be told. That takes the sting out of the tail of some of that privacy um, issue, I think, although it doesn't help in retrospect for the people who are already in that position. Um, but I think there are still some times when people do feel that that's a particularly sensitive area, and I think it's probably the last remnant of that, and I think that probably was the case in 2008 when, when people were looking at that, just the idea that maybe that just doesn't need to be shared freely. Except that the whole of the hospital works under the same confidentiality rules as we do and have the same constraints as we do, and it makes no sense to me not to be able to share that. And the egg donation bit's an absolute key point of it because if you want to test somebody for Down syndrome, you need to know the age of the donor, not the age of the woman. And if you don't ask the question, for all the reasons that we've heard, you, you may not get the answer that you need. Um, yeah, so exactly as you said, it's usually when um, you get power of attorney, for example, over your parent or your husband or wife, or for example, if somebody you know, dies, even in these situations, accessing a medical record is still legally quite difficult. You have to completely justify it. So it's not, I wouldn't argue that it's a very high risk situation and people will be accessing medical records lots all of a sudden. But it will be something you want to think about and whether we want to put any steps in place to mitigate that or change the conversation around telling children about donor conception and other kind of things. Susan, and then we'll take your question as well. Um, this, this is perhaps one for, for Jane as well. And, um, I'm just thinking about some some groups of patients, perhaps, where they undergo fertility treatments, but they are particularly concerned that they want to keep it a secret, perhaps, from the wider family, for perhaps religious reasons or anything, background reasons. Um, how would we deal with that if the secrecy was removed? How would we reassure them that? Or how would we ensure, in fact, that nobody would find out um, about the fact that they had all undergone fertility treatment and around just donor treatments, um, when perhaps there's a, a huge stigma and taboo um, in certain countries and religions? Thank you. I think that's true. There will, there will be groups where things seem to be much more sensitive than perhaps um, we're generally used to, maybe particularly in religious groups. Um, just where they've got particularly difficult families, I suppose, but um, they have no, those families have no greater right to understand about any of their medical history, and so uh, we have to be able to provide that same reassurance as, as for anything else. And I think um, Katrina's point about the, um, the rules about around termination, for instance, I mean, it's a very similar sensitive issue that people. Um, find themselves in the position of, of terminating a pregnancy, whether for fetal abnormality, for social reasons, or because they just can't cope with yet another child, for instance. And uh, those nobody expects that that will be disclosed to the family or, or, or a secret given away, and, and they will do that, not willingly, because nobody really goes into that in a very voluntary way, but will undergo that understanding that that's the case, and I don't think that the fertility side should be different. It can come down to, do you believe that your medical notes are confidential? If they're confidential, then why would it matter? It's only going to benefit. If your notes go with you, it's only going to further support. And if there's any risks at all, they absolutely 100% should go with you. And I completely believe 
that when someone is leaving the fertility clinic, if they were asked the same question then, they may very well answer it differently. But in my mind, NHS notes are confidential. All NHS notes. And I completely believe that there are a lot of people that don't want it shared, what's in their notes. So I suppose it's what you believe, but I have trust that they're confidential and that information shouldn't be shared out with the departments that they're meant to be at. If I could just add to that, of course, quite a lot of our fertility centres are, are in the private sector or standalone centres. They may have NHS contracts, but they actually do literally stand alone and don't have the, the sort of um, integration that we have into our NHS trust, for instance. And if you're going to transfer notes from one centre to another, it makes sense to make sure that your patient's happy with that happening. If you're going to send notes from a standalone centre into a trust, then you would expect that you would have asked the patient for permission to pass that information on. But that's the normal courtesy that I would ask my patients if I'm going to write to the diabetologist as well, because she's got a complicated <coughs> um, condition going on. I would ask to say, I want to write to this person, is that okay? And most of the time it is okay. I can't, I can't even remember anybody saying, don't write to them, I don't want them to know that I'm looking at fertility treatment. Of course we want us to be able to do that, because we want to be able to make sure we're doing it all properly and safely. So it, it is the same courtesy, in fact, and, and the centres, the standalone centres, may not be bound in the same way as the NHS confidentiality, but they're absolutely bound in the same way for medical confidentiality, just as much as anywhere else is. Okay, I think there was a question here. If we can get the mic, and then we'll come to you next, okay. Um, so I've worked in IVF for the past 11 years, and I must admit I'm very keen that it would not be a medical secret any longer. Um, so a few observations. One, filling out the CT forms, I think pretty much University of Scotland, there's great pressure on the patients to say yes to disclosure confidentiality to the extent of sometimes consultants are saying, oh, we can't treat them, especially NHS, if they don't get permission. Um, so I don't feel sometimes there is an awful freedom of choice there. Um, I certainly often say to my patients, you realise, you know, this level of confidentiality is good in some ways, but then anything happens to you, if you're not down by a bus, you're going through treatment, you know, it's, you, you're going to have to tell somebody, if they scan you, you can do a race, you know, what's going on here, something's, this patient ill. Um, so, and, and the other thing is, you know, often you go into the hospital now with everything being on track in, in the hospital system, and the first thing you read is a letter from the renal you know, consultant saying, this patient's on the IVF waiting list, so, you know, there's no problem with them saying that, we can't see anything, but anybody else within the hospital, so the, the information often is out there anyway. Um, and I just think, especially, with, you know, getting rid of notes all together, it really is safer for the patients that it's all out there. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. And in fact, that was the point I was going to make because, Gwenda, you've talked about physical notes going from A to B, but that's really less of a, co you know, kind of a concept now. But I think, Jane, you alluded to this as well, where you dictate a letter or you have a letter typed from a clinic and it can't go to another set of hospital notes to a other treating consultant because of this disclosure and this barrier between, you know, free flow of what is useful information, as you say, particularly with our increasingly complicated patients where they may have other medical conditions or they're older or whatever. And actually, it's really important that you have a join up of care between those that are looking after their dialysis or their kidney function or whatever, and also us, you know, and, and what the impact of, of, of treatment or overstimulation or, or sedation or whatever we're doing to them is. So you need to have that crossover. Um, and I, I, I also get what you're saying about there's a bit of a, potentially a bit of a sort of expectation, just tick these boxes and sign that form, that's fine, that keeps us all right kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think, um, I guess that's the point I was trying to get to was why, do, you know, why wouldn't we change this? You know, what, what am I missing the point here? So, um, you know, there may be other things. And if we change it, do we stay from this date forward? Or do we, does the law change and it becomes an open field? And as you say, then you've got a retrospective thing where donor con, you know, conception and so on was completely anonymized. Pre you know, how, how, depth, how deep does that change in law go? I'm kind of blown away by this email. I'm so glad I came. I didn't realize I was going to hear uh, three presentations which confirmed what I've been thinking for a long, long time. 
So thank you very much. Um, and particularly from Wendy, your, your presentation was just absolutely spot on. Thank you. And it was, you don't need to be nervous, it was just fantastic. <laughs> um, I used to do a lot of infertility counselling, and I always said to the couples, have you told your GP? Have you thought about keeping your GP informed about what your plans are, what your decisions are? Um, and sometimes they have and sometimes they haven't. And it occurs to me that perhaps in terms of kind of policy and, and public thinking, we're on a kind of journey that happened in the sense of what happened with adoption. Adoption is considered to be a once-off event. I mean, that's just total garbage. It's something that is with you throughout the life course. It's something that is always with you um, in, in one way. And I think that is the situation if you've had infertility treatment. Not something that you can think about every day, but it's part of who you are and how you've got to where you are. Um, so I think the fact that um, we're suggesting that the suggestion should be, it shouldn't be so tightly uh, banded uh, is just, I think, such a good thing for the reasons that you said, that sort of further down the line, things can just go absolutely haywire. And if the people are supposed to help you, don't know why you're doing that, then that's, that's not good. So I'm just wondering whether, while we wait for the slow processes at Westminster or wherever to take their course, are there things that we could be doing, like um, working groups to provide um, leaflets for pa patients, um, kind of more kind of get together multidisciplinary, maybe a little leaflets in clinics to say, you know, this is what the law is, but you might want to think about it, etc. Good point. Can I get you to pass the microphone just behind you two ladies? That's it. Um, hello. Um, my name is Kate Smith. I am a consultant in public health medicine and I come from the data side. And I was, it's really, to say, I was really struck by when your, um, your presentation of thinking about the needs of women and the fact that from a data point of view, we can't support to the, the service to identify the needs of women and particularly the needs of women who are coming out unsuccessfully from treatment. And that was a really big one for me because there's half a chance that if you enter into a medical follow-up through antenatal care, you may have the opportunity to disclose that. But the, having not been successful in thinking about the needs of those women, given all of the challenges that you raised, um, and, and not being able to support that from a data point of view is really, really frustrating. Might add a little thing. Uh, gentleman at the front here. I would like to put it to the panel that our topic tonight shouldn't be does infertility need to be a medical secret, but a personal secret. After all, the secrecy doesn't arise from a medical conspiracy to keep it secret. It arises from the patient's feelings, which our second speaker spoke about very very touchingly, the negative feelings associated with infertility are essentially the reason, the reason why we wrap it all up in, in secret. And in a way, I think our gathering tonight of carers and people who are not infertile or have not demonstrated their infertility We can all <coughs> see the benefits of sharing information if we're going to deliver holistic care. It's essential that we know everything that there is to be known about the patient. But that isn't necessarily the patient's view. Yeah, good point. But then I guess the flip side of that is do we endorse it by putting a legal framework around it that makes us as medical practitioners keep that? Go and take it away, panel. So, just yourself, um, we to let you know how <clears throat> how serious it can be. So, we have a more to life pack 
of the charity and we continue to support people regardless of the outcome of the journey. So that's for, for um, people who are unsuccessful. But we can't give that medical support, we can only give the emotional support. But just recently um, our MTL coordinator actually had to go and receive trauma-informed training because it is such a traumatic event for them. It reminds me of what I was going to add to that actually. Yeah. The follow-up of patients after unsuccessful treatment is a really, really important part of what we do. And Gwenda, it struck me when you were talking about your patients' experience, they rang in with their negative test, and that was the end of it. That seems to be a common story, and I think I think that's negligent. I think they should be seen for their pregnancy test, and when they have a negative test, they should be supported, and we should see them back for review. Whatever their next plans are, they should be offered that which is what we would do as standard, and I think it's shameful that people are asked to bring in their negative tests and don't have any further. Um, but I think, to me, part of that is symptomatic of this separation, the sort of isolation of fertility treatment within little blocks of work instead of being very much, as, as I described, embedded in the NHS service, which is where I think it should be. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a risk of the whole thing about commissioning and everything else is this is separateness. Whilst it's slightly off the point, um, the secrecy hasn't helped with that, I think. And I would acknowledge what you say about patients. Of course, they need to have a say in that, but it's not our experience that people are worried about that and they're keeping it secret. There's much more now openness to discuss and want to, to put themselves out there, although that might not be across the board, of course. Um, just some of the things that we've been talking about and making you think that... Um, Many of us will do a lawyer's response generally to anything to do with stigma, anxiety, anything controversial is to panic, immediately wrap up in a lot of rules so everybody is protected. And as, you, as you'll have seen in my slide, the, the amount of steps that people have to go through even before they sign the consent form, it probably does just create even, even more anxiety. It, it's, more, it's more stuff for people to go through, but as lawyers who are, are quite often removed from that situation, Wrapping things up in cotton wool is what has always been done in the past, and it's the job of things like this to break that down a bit and think about how to smooth these processes out so they're not so anxiety inducing for the person that actually has to experience the end of that law. Okay, I'm one of Kate's colleagues, and I wanted to explain slightly uh, the point that I heard from what she was making. I, I, I'm interested because I also uh, work with uh, health data in the public interest. Do you know whether the panel members would very eloquently make the case for why there should not be a medical secret in individual cases? Uh, how would they feel about the use of data in the broader public interest? Because one of the great uh, benefits, as I see it, of having a solidarity health service uh, in the United Kingdom is that we can all benefit from the appropriate and very carefully controlled use of everybody's data. And of course, uh, fertility treatment data is strictly out of bounds. And it's always struck me that that makes it very difficult to know about the long term effects of these things because we're kind of a bit dependent on people who are doing the treatments to report things. And so, for example, in Scotland, we're able to look at even small, subtle effects of people being born at 39 or 40 weeks and track through uh, looking at their educational attainment 16, 17 years later. But of course we can't begin to tackle questions like whether the various fertility treatments might have these uh, broad uh, effects. And maybe we're better off not knowing that thing but uh, I, I'm, I'm not convinced. So do you draw a distinction between sharing of individual data for individual benefit and sharing data under these carefully controlled circumstances regulated in Scotland by the Public Benefit and Privacy uh, Panel. Okay, and if the microphone can just come to the front here, we'll have one more question and then back to the panel. Just here on the right, thank you. <coughs> thank you. It's more of an observation and personal experience and a question, that's okay. Um, as a former patient, I have to say, I thought when I did presentations first class, it really summed up the patient's experience and the emotions you go through. But 
Um, some years ago, I was admitted to patient. Um, I unfortunately lost the baby at 20 weeks, and um, I then was successful with my fertility treatment and went into very early or 25 or 26 weeks. On both occasions, when I was being treated in the hospital, uh, nobody knew that I had been through fertility treatment, and I think, although I did try to share that at one point, I don't think the, the health professionals really understood the the difference when you've been through fertility treatment, something like that for me, because it can be the only shot um, at being a mum. Um, and I think I would describe it terribly when I was a baby, or I have a very premature baby who is now thankfully six foot and um, very, very healthy. Um, but I, I think my care would have been different, um, and I think they would have understood better where I was coming from if it hadn't been a medical secret. So I think definitely it, it shouldn't be. Um, but I think the, the education program that we're doing to do in terms of often which helps to educate midwives and health professionals and all others um, is another good way of trying to get that message out there as well. Yeah, very good point. Yeah. So can we come back to the panel then to think about big protected anonymized data sets that might inform health decisions or policy decisions or political strategy or something on those lines. What do we think about that? Well, there is areas that it already is done in so for the lights of the waiting times, it's just anonymised um, and they are signed up to be um, licensed by the HFPA, I think, to be able to have some of that data, but it is um, anonymous data. Um, I think you're right, I mean, the, 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 the argument for having for sharing information about a particular patient and their medical issues I think is very compelling, but I think there's also this, this idea about um, doing big sort of population studies. It is possible to do that, but I think it's incredibly difficult to, to match up. The HFPA have an enormous amount of data, very little used, um, and to match up that data. The biggest issue that has happened, I think, more recently is that with the introduction of the CD forms, there is this bit about um, asking specific permission for whether or not the data can be used for either anonymous or, sorry, for contact or non-contact and then contact research, for which patients will often say no, which means that actually it's an incomplete data set now, which I think is regrettable. Previously it was absolutely everybody and now the access is different. I don't know quite how, probably you'll be able to say so, how that fits with normal big matching data sets and, and the consent for sharing data in that setting. I've heard people say that you have to have explicit consent for any big database, which is not the practice normally at all, but you might have a view on that. I don't know if I, oh, sorry, Karen. I don't know. I was just going to, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to chip in at this point, but some of you may know I do quite a lot of research in male infertility, and we have in Scotland the share register, so this is a health registry that people sign in and say, yes, I'm interested in being part of a research, whether it's a demographic or a data set or being part of a study, and there's over half a million people recruited in it. It's really exciting how many people are coded in that data set for having male infertility, 34 as at a month ago. So, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, you've got fantastic data, actually a lot of it, in the HFEA, but it sits outside of your general medical, your general whatever it is, ICD kind of coding and stuff that sits on general medical records. And, uh, you know, there's already emerging data looking at male infertility and these links to long-term health problems, prostatic cancer and so on. You know, this is really, you know, where we should be able to an, you know, anonymous data, but to, to use it in a really constructive way would be a very, very powerful thing. And again, this all stops it all happening. So, uh, you know, my heart's with you. And you know, any way we can yeah, unravel yeah. that to 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 um, you know to have better information to inform the future, I think it's all a good thing. But um, yes, sorry, I should stop repeating. That's a really good point. I was going to raise the panel and. <clears throat> We focused really on the women and the sort of the, the um, risk to women's health because you were sort of you know, you know, the immediate you know, pregnancy issues successful and then you know, mental health issues. But what about the man? 
in a, his, you know, his mental health, and he might be like alluded to there, you know, potentially could have some long-term health consequences. So I'm not prepared to answer that, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that I necessarily specifically made that exclusion, but you're quite right, a lot of it has to do with pregnancy and health and well-being of carrying a pregnancy. But we certainly in our clinics see men with all sorts of medical problems. We can have all sorts of things coming through. We liaise all the time with the endocrinologist for male fertility issues. Um, and one of the absolute case in points is one of my endocrine colleagues who has written to me just very recently saying, I'm never going to be able to look at these letters. We're sharing patients. This is a man who's a, a, a gentleman who's treating men with endocrine problems, which will help, help their fertility and mediate with him, but he's a specialist in this area. And unless I put him on my license, despite the fact he never spends any time in the clinic, I can't allow him to see the letters from our department talking about the sperm, the quality of the sperm, how it's improving, what's happening with the, with the partner and everything else. So it's absolutely right. It's not just to do with women and their medical problems and their pregnancy. It's to do with the whole kit and caboodle. And it's, it, it's a real shame. This is, um, while I wholeheartedly support um, having this not as a medical secret anymore, this is why I raised a question mark in my last slide um, about whether we might still want to have, not that I necessarily support it, but just to think about whether we might still want to have consent for people like partners and for their identifying information to be transferred across. Um, for exactly for the reason that it will quite often be the male partner and it might be very intimate details about their fertility or any of their health problems. Um, and just a bit, probably need to do empirical research on that, but on what, what's appropriate. Perhaps I can also remind you that up until the time that they start licensed treatment, actually any of the investigations and the discussions and everything else about couples and a lot of the um, of that work isn't necessarily done in fertility sense. It, it, it is in ours. We do the whole thing from GP referral right the way through. But there's a lot of fertility work that, that happens outside of licensed centres, which will be in their general medical things, including all of that private information that they might otherwise have um, concerned about. So it's only the treatment that comes under the licence and, and the secrecy bit. Um, but it's that practical process that needs the sharing as well. Um, I guess, you know, the end of October was Fertility Awareness Week. Fertility Network did some great job, you know, kind of promoting. There was the hashtag Men Matter. You know, I'm not just about the men, but I think that they do have a very much quieter voice than women within the fertility setting. And I really genuinely think that, you know, from everything that Gwenda has said, you can put a man in that sentence instead of a woman. And they are very much the kind of the, the lesser being in terms of they, they don't have that medical support. We don't talk about it. And if we don't talk about it as a medical secret, then we're never going to unravel that and we're never going to be able to support our patients properly. It kind of comes back to what you're saying about how people feel about things individually. But I think how, how you feel about any medical condition is going to be an individual thing. But we don't need to make it worse by wrapping it up in a secret. And certainly in Dundee, we're trying to push, you know, male infertility clinics something more around around men and I hope that other clinics will follow suit but you know I think men are just such an important part of that story and often are kind of you know ram raided to one side expected to be the stronger other half and and, and and not perhaps having their needs met at all. I'm in this debate as well I work as a counsellor in the Edinburgh for some um, clinic so yeah I'd be all for it becoming um, not a secret anymore. I wondered about the area of welfare of the child um, it can happen as a counsellor and, and as the team of, I'm sure you've all seen it, where you really begin to worry about a couple or an individual coming through for treatment uh, and about their mental health and then they don't want that disclosed. Um, and, it, and it has actually happened where you, you're, you're really stuck that you need to you really want to, to let um, the other people who be looking after this mother uh, know that they're really suffering with their mental health and I think that's a really important thing for welfare of the mother and the father um, and the child. I think welfare of the child might trump the, I think that always trumps the, the confidentiality about um, assisted conception, but um, yeah, it can be a, a delicate one. It's an interesting one. We'll come back to that in a moment. If I could just take the question from the gentleman behind you. Yes, yeah, so it was a question really for um, Wendy Burns. My name is Carl McDonough. I work for a bioethics charity in Scotland. Some years ago, I was teaching uh, at uh, some nurses in Glasgow on medical ethics and asked them, if they knew what would happen with the medical files once they died, not one of them knew what was going to happen. And I'm sure if you ask anybody in the street what happens to the medical files when they, once they die, 
Nobody knows. And I know GPs who got dead patients' medical files lying around in their computers. So I, I recognize what you're saying, and I think it might be a solution. But if it does become the solution, we would have to really tighten up um, the information that is given to patients about what is happening to this their information with the GPs, but also with the hospitals. And this will happen, for example, um, once they die. In the past, I don't know if it's changed, but we did some research uh, on this about 12, 13 years ago. And if your medical files were really interesting, they could be kept forever with your name on it, and, and research could be done on it. If your medical files were really boring, they were just destroyed. So all this would need to be clarified in the, in the mind of the general public in Scotland. And personally, and this is, I speak personally, I believe all this should be regulated in, 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 in Parliament. And I'm, I'm always concerned when I hear that research is taking place just because some committee that was set up by the chief medical officer or the chief science officer decided that there would be a medical, a, a medical committee that would decide all this information for the Scottish people. I think all this personally should really go in front of the Scottish Parliament and then they can decide on behalf of the Scottish people. So I think there's a very clear thing that safeguarding would trump all of it. So if there's a safeguarding issue, it's reported through the normal channels and has to be as a legal thing. Um, so if, if you have somebody who has such significant mental health issues and is pregnant from um, treatment and you're worried about welfare of the child or indeed for pregnancy, then there may be an issue to, to, to report there. One of the things that we have a real problem with, um, and I don't know if that's other people's experience, is getting... Um, help to assess couples where we're worried about their social setup, their financial setup, possibly, although not generally speaking, but their social the, the, their setup um, before they've conceived. So, if you have somebody who a couple who seem to be in difficulties um, and they conceived on their own, as soon as they're pregnant, then there's a potential for that child to be put on an at-risk register, or at least for a process to be put in place for social work intervention, all kinds of things. We cannot get that help preconception, and I think that's regrettable because, in fact, what we want is to be able to help people to understand what their own limitations are to get support to put in place. Not because we don't want to help them with their fertility hopes, but because we want to make sure it's done well, and we have to be obliged to take into account the welfare of the child. In answer to your question, or your comment at the back there. Um, I'm not sure that that's different from any other medical issues. So that's the point we're trying to make. I mean, those 40 years or however long you keep the notes for is the same for anything, really, and, and we would argue that this shouldn't be any different. Yes, I would take your points. I take them completely on board, and um, everyone's opinion and thoughts on it can only help to the discussion. Um, I would say that the fertility clinics aren't Fort Knox, so they're within the hospitals and the same risks that you're talking about would even apply there. It's not like they're, they're jailed up somewhere, um, they're just in another unit. Um, I would also like to add that following successful treatment that you are at higher risk of um, postnatal illness as well. And that's why I spoke about um, your health visitor, because as my GP, I had a great GP, described it to me. Um, it was like all those hormones, so if you're going through treatment and the drugs and they've played about with your hormones and then you're successful and your hormones are all over the place. And it was like someone just turning off that tap. And for a lot of people, there's only one way to go, and that's another layer of support that's not there. One thing I was going to mention as well is I think that when you see friends and people who have been successful with treatment, you almost notice that they feel that they're not able to say that it's hard to be a parent because you should, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, but it kind of seems like it's a a much more difficult transition to parenthood and the realities of parenthood because it's hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hi, I'm a patient, or am a patient. I have a little boy from IVA. I was always very, very open and I just told everybody because I was just so happy to be able to fit down anyway. <laughs> and I was so supported. I forgot to have a baby at the end of it. 
had a baby, the first thing I said was, oh my God, I had a baby. And that's when it hit home. And that's when I needed the support thing more than anything. Sorry. <laughs> I'm also pregnant now, so. <laughs> Hormones galore. Um, but yeah, and I think that's been the support for me. I was supported so well through my pregnancy. And I felt all that stuff that came up, it was all about. But when I had my son, that's when it kicked in. And that's when actually I probably needed a little bit more. Because, yeah, you're scared. The people that are in your family are in time for you. And that's when it all kicks home at this I think that point's absolutely right. When you've been through the roller coaster of fertility treatment um, and you finally, maybe after five years, sometimes a lot longer, you finally have this baby that you have tried so hard for and it's the thing you wanted most in the whole world. And suddenly it's not perfect because the baby cries during the night and you don't get everything right, but but you can't give yourself permission to say it's hard <coughs> because look, this is what you wanted, this, this is what you tried really, really hard for, and now you've got it, so how can you possibly complain? So that point is, is absolutely spot on, and I think, I think there's a whole load of support needed um, around that, as well as those people who are unsuccessful. I think the biggest issue is there's just not enough support being funded out there at the minute to, to kind of catch everybody. Um, and maybe a more joined up approach from, from the clinics and the GPs and the health visitors and the support charities. Maybe a lot more funding for that kind of support would be something that would be um, really helpful. It's really good feedback. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Yes, sir. Another snugget. I worked for some years in Oman where. Uh, at that time, the development of infertility services was less well developed. And part of the problem was that patients would go to the Emirates, or they would go to Bahrain, or they would go to Kuwait, and they would get elements of investigation carried out in these different places with no continuity of care. And eventually, some of my um, more fore foreseeing staff devised a patient held infertility record, which was astonishingly successful. And I think in the context of our discussions, as an educational tool to allow patients to feel that they still have an element of control about their information, but at the same time, demonstrating to them that that information is enormously valuable when it's shared. Yeah. I, I would absolutely agree with that. Certainly from Dundee, we write to our patients. We don't write to a GP. We write to the patient. We've seen you in clinic. This is what we've talked about. These are the investigations you've had done. These are the results. This is what we're going to do next. You know, here's our counselling number, etc., etc. So you empower the patient to have handheld stuff that they have with them that they can choose to disclose or not because that's the way around it as it, as it stands at the minute. Current patient perspective. Please change this rule because I find myself standing in my GP practice who's not believed me that I require a specific medication from him. And I've stood there on a the mobile phone in my clinic on one end of the phone and my GP on the other trying to relay information to get permission to get a prescription. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I love my staff and my clinic dearly, I really do. But having one more time to spend in another hospital setting or a GP when you're stressed through the whole process that please try and help the patients when they go through that. But one last thing we have to worry about is just communication between the GP and your client. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think perhaps the patient is the, you know, the person to, 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 if they, if you own and hold that, then you can share it as you need to, um, you know, until the law changes to be more effective. Um, last comments from anybody here at the, uh, in the panel? Any last thoughts, sentences, please? Observations. For lots of reasons, I'm wholly in support of changing the um, confidentiality rules, although I appreciate that it is a, an enigma on how to do it. <laughs> no, I'd absolutely reiterate that. I 
wholeheartedly supported it. And I know that lawyers can be difficult. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> but there are ways to do it. It's been done before. It's been relaxed before with the Disclosure of Information Act and various statutory instruments. So it's not as bleak as maybe I painted it, hopefully. <laughs> Hi, I would just like to echo um, the points made um, and say a huge thank you to everyone that asked questions and gave comments this evening and thank you for coming and listening to the three of us and thank you Sarah for being such a fantastic chair and obviously to Sarah for holding the event. And without stealing Sarah's thunder thank you to Progress Education Trust and thank you to the Scottish Government for putting us in this amazing venue.